Alright, we've seen the where, now let's see the who. Your game of Thea will be spent giving commands to your characters, putting their skills to good use in the gathering of materials, creating of equipment, and eventually, or at least possibly, restoring the light to Thea. Here's a character now. You can tell by the symbol here that he's one of my crafters, and so, for that reason, and that I talked to my brother right before this video, I'm going to click on the feather icon here and rename him to Sorty LaForge. The picture in the bottom here is his health. You can see he's got 18 out of 18 HP, so he hasn't been beaten up recently. The number over here is his carrying limit. This is always 50 times whatever his strength rating is, so he can carry 250, we'll say pounds, since I'm American. Of that, he is equipped with 186 pounds worth of gear, which right now is a 42 pound crafting tool, a 64 pound crossbow, and an 80 pound spear. There are eight equipment slots available in Thea. The top left is for a non-combat tool, which means something that will either increase your crafting or your gathering. You should probably have something in this slot for every character you have, and for anyone who isn't a crafter, it should probably be a gathering tool. Weight limits and material availability notwithstanding. The top right is a ranged weapon slot. Ranged weapons increase your ranged damage skill, but that's it. This slot is somewhat more of a luxury. Certainly put any bows you find on people, but spending the time to make them yourself is likely to be the bottom of your priority list. The second spot on the left is the armor slot. This slot is primarily for armor and shielding, but, and this is kind of big, any armor made with a gemstone as its secondary material will also have a completely random bonus skill on it as well. So once you have a steady supply of gemstones, the armor slot can also be used, with some lucky rolling, to augment a character's main skills. The slot to the right of armor is the artifact, and while I'm at it, I'll also highlight the two bottom slots, which are the jewelry slots. Combined, I like to call these items accessories. The equipment that goes into these areas are pieces that have a wide range of skill boosts on them, based on the materials that were used to craft them. Unlike weapons and armor, where more powerful materials usually just mean a more powerful equipment piece, for the accessory items, what they actually do is entirely based on what made them up. An artifact made from elven wood will be totally different from one made with normal wood. These items are great, low weight ways to increase the powers of your characters, but you will need a steady access to a wide range of materials before your entire team can make good use of them. The remaining two slots are your two hands. This is where weapons and shields go. Weapons increase your damage attribute, and shields increase your shielding attribute, mostly. Note that Thea the Awakening does not have the concept of dual wielding, so your choices are two-handed weapon, or one-handed weapon with optional shield. Or if you're a warrior, I'll get to that in a bit. Not all characters have all equipment slots available to them. A lot of beasts, for example, can only wear accessories, which is why most beasts don't tend to do well late game. The game will not let you equip more on a person than they can carry. It is possible, if you get a temporary strength blessing, for you to put on more than their normal maximum. But as soon as that buff wears off, the character will lose the benefits of all of their gear until their carry weight is brought back down. So, that's the gear, but really, all gear is, is just methods to increase your attributes found down here. I've been using the words attributes, skills, and abilities sort of interchangeably in this series, but they all mean the same thing. These. To the right of the attributes is an option to filter them in case the screen is getting overcluttered. There are 57 total things that can appear in the box down here. 23 of them are skills, and the rest are buffs, curses, and other types of temporary effects. The wiki has a nice comprehensive list of these, which I'll link again in the video description, as well as fade to a screenshot of right now. Every single skill except one has at least some application in a skill challenge. That lone holdout is the crafting skill, but don't worry Mr. Crafting, you more than make up for it with how important you are out of combat. 
I'll save talking about a skill's combat use for the combat video, and instead focus on what they do for you in a turn-to-turn -turn sense. So, back to the game. First is that some encounters require that the encountered party has someone with a specific skill up to a specific level, either to activate a specific blue fonted option, or possibly even for the event to occur at all. For this reason, and really this reason alone, you want to make sure that every party you have, including your town, tries to have as wide an assortment of skills available to it as possible. More skills means more options during encounters. Second, is that some skills affect what you can do, or how fast you can do it. The gathering and crafting skills affect how fast you can, you know, gather and craft, which I'll give a demonstration of in the next video, Towns and Parties. The strength skill determines what your carrying capacity is. Your health determines your likelihood of dying should you start taking physical damage, and the medic skill counteracts your chance of dying. I said in the Game Options video that I'd explain more about this skill in the Character video, and here we are, so here it goes. The likelihood of someone dying due to depleted health is based on how badly they are hurt as a percent of their total hit points. Above 30%, you're fine. After you fall below 30%, the difference between 30% and your current health is the death chance when you hit the End Turn button. So, for example, if someone is at 10% health, then their chance of dying is 30 minus 10, or 20%. If the bloodbath option is turned off, this means the highest death chance you can suffer is 30%. With the bloodbath on, your health can go into the negatives, and as such, your chance of death can go sky high. I think there is a 99% cap on the chance, but really, that may as well be guaranteed. The ability of the medic skill to save lives is based on any group's top two medics. And note when I say medics, I'm referring to people with the medic skill, not necessarily those of the medic class. The best medic reduces the chance of death by their medic skill as a flat percent, and the second best medic further reduces the chance by half of their skill. So, as an example, Let's say our guy from earlier has 10% health when we end the turn, giving him a 20% chance to die. Let's say that he is also in a group with two people that have the medic skill, one at a rating of 10 and one at a rating of 6. The best guy with the 10 skill will reduce this chance by 10, and the second best guy has a skill of 6, which as the second medic gets halved down to 3. So the townsperson in peril will have his 20% chance of death lowered by 13%, all the way down to 7. Not ideal, but way better than 20%. Now, Bloodbath. The downside of Bloodbath is, again, that a character's hit points can drop into the negative, causing their potential death chance to go way higher than 30%. But the upside to Bloodbath is that the effect of the medics is multiplied by a massive value of 4, so in the previous example, if Bloodbath is on, the injured town person would actually be getting 13 times 4, or a 52% reduction in death chance. Since he only had a 20% chance to start with, this basically negates it. I believe it is actually a 1% minimum chance, but really in roguelike games, 1% chances are not something you worry about as long as you aren't facing them constantly. Indeed, that townsperson with two medic groupmates of skills 10 and 6 has the same chance of life at 10% health with Bloodbath off as he would have at negative 29% health with Bloodbath on. Now obviously, with Bloodbath off, he could never get to negative 29% health, but still. As long as you have good medics in every party, the danger that the Bloodbath option brings to your characters is minimal, and so long as people are only in the 0-30% to HP range, Bloodbath actually increases survival chance. Go figure. Okay, enough about death. How about the last aspect of a character, their class and race, as indicated by the icon here? Side note, almost all humans have a distinct class picture other than the Witch and Sage which share one. For almost all other races, orc, elves, demons, beasts, whatever, they all share a single race icon. That doesn't mean that an orc worker will level the same way as an orc matriarch, though. 
race and class have some impact on event generation, and a very few have a special other bonus that I will mention at the end. But on a turn-to-turn -turn basis, their main impact is on how a character grows every time the experience meter fills. When it does, every one you have will gain an increase of one point to a skill, with about a 20% chance of that being two points instead. Which stat gets raised is pseudo-random. So let's get the random part out of the way first. It is possible for any character in the game to gain any stat. Your weakling medic might get two points of strength, or your brutish warrior might find themselves with a point of magic. It's a very low chance, but it can happen, and over a long enough game of Fia, it's bound to happen at least a few times. As for the pseudo part, there are weights applied to which skill which person will see increases in. These weights come from two main sources. The first is a person's race and class. A human warrior, for example, will tend towards health, strength, and the tactics skill. An orc worker will tend towards strength, gathering, and crafting, etc. The other is what skills a person already has, and this is the part that you can use to try to guide RNG to your benefit. It's exceedingly rare that a warrior will get a point of magic, but once he has that first point, his likelihood of getting more over time goes up dramatically. Still less likely than a point of tactics, but over the course of 100 level ups, just a few extra magic points can be significant. The reason you can use this to guide the RNG is that the game doesn't care about the source of the skill when doing its skill chance calculation. For example, the god choice Lada gives a plus 3 bonus to all your character's attractiveness rating, so even people who don't have any natural attractiveness will still get checked as if they do. Alternately, the totem building in your town gives a bonus to magic of everyone that is in town. So whenever a level up occurs, anyone in town will have magic, and as such, even people who don't normally have any magic skill will have a slightly elevated chance of spiking a point in it. Trying to guide a specific character to a specific point on a specific level up is a fool's action but trying to guide your entire civilization towards certain skills over an entire game certainly isn't. And lastly, the specific bonuses that I mentioned. The one that everyone will always have access to is the Human Warrior's special bonus, the ability to wield a two-handed sword in one hand. I'll go over this more in the combat video, but swords are the most defensive weapon choice in the game. By being able to wield a two-hander in one hand, this means you can pair it with a shield, making a human warrior one of the game's better physical tanks, even if many other races and classes end up being way stronger. There are also a couple rare, named, special individuals who can use any two-handed weapon in one hand, but I won't spoil them here. The other big bonus is piercing damage, given to all elves, as well as all bees, and the mythical Viatroviac, and a few others. Again, I'll go over more into that during the combat video, but piercing damage is a major advantage in a fight, almost to the point that elves are better to have in combat than orcs and dwarves. But don't tell them I said that. Anyway, that's the scoop on your people. Next up will be the video on what happens when you put them all together, towns and parties.